Hello and welcome to Credit Matters TV. I am Sharif Medavian, a manager in the Residential Mortgage Group at Standard & Poor's. And I am joined today by a few colleagues to talk about the mortgage finance reform uh, efforts in the, in the U.S. in a recent article that was published by Standard & Poor's. We have four different uh, presenters here, and we're going to split them into two different videos. And in this first segment, I'm going to be speaking with Jeremy Schneider, a director in the Residential Mortgage Group, as well as Monica Perlmuter in the Servicer Evaluations and Mortgage Originations Group. Jeremy, thank you for coming. Hey, thanks for having me, Sharif. Can you tell us a little bit about the article and overview before we talk to, to various authors of the piece? Sure, absolutely. So the, the article is entitled, U.S. mortgage finance reform efforts and the potential uh, implications on credit. And we published it October 11th, and really the essence of the article is talking about some of the more recent proposals as far as mortgage finance reform is concerned. Uh, with, you know, the housing market doing better, it's, it's starting to take uh, more of a, a front stage. And, and the two uh, proposals that we've seen, uh, there's actually been three, but the main proposals are the PATH Act from the House and the Corker Warner Bill uh, from the Senate. And each have their unique characteristics, but they uh, both seem to have somewhat of the same intent. And that is to kind of decrease the, the government footprint in the, in the mortgage space and uh, move it more towards a, a private secondary market. So uh, you think about right now, a lot of the origination is Fannie Freddie. And you know, the ultimate goal is to continue to promote home affordability, mm -hmm. home ownership, but at the same time, minimize the taxpayer burden. Let's talk a little bit about the Corker Warner proposal because I know uh, that was announced some time ago and it involves the FMIC, a federal insurer. I, I assume, I believe that would be the, the staff or the infrastructure in the FHFA right now uh, going to that insurer. But they talk about covering a 10 percent, uh, beyond a 10 percent first loss piece which would go to private investors. Mm -hmm. What is your opinion from a credit perspective of what a 10 percent cushion means before you know, you'd have impact to the taxpayers. Sure, and that's a good question because I know there's been a lot of discussion in the market. Uh, Corker Warner is specific because comparatively to PATH, it has a little bit more of a government uh, involvement where they issue these covered securities. First 10% though, that wouldn't be backed by the, the government would be borne by private investors. So the question being, as you said, is 10% sufficient? Well, what we did is in the article, we looked at our archetypical prime mortgage pool. And when we look at our archetypical prime mortgage pool, we're looking at a 725 FICO, we're looking at a 75% loan to value where you would have 25% equity in the property. What we effectively get to is a 7.5% loss expectation in a AAA environment. So when you compare that to the 10%, it, it seems like it would be somewhat of a sufficient number. Now the key here is the fact that under the proposal, the covered securities can include qualified mortgages. Now a qualified mortgage may not have to have a 725 FICO, it may not have to have a 75 loan to value. It could have a much lower FICO, it could have a much higher loan to value. So as a result, when you start to deviate from the 725 FICO and the 75 LTV, you start to move away from that 7.5%. And theoretically, you could climb pretty high, well above the 10%. So the big question is, comparatively, what in the proposal are they looking to make it akin to? You know, they refer to a moderate or extreme, or excuse me, a moderate to severe stress we look at a triple A being seven and a half, so I think the question is what would they really expect? Mm -hmm. I understand. Now we're going to be speaking to some of the analysts that cover various market segments, but could you give us just a brief overview of the impact of this, uh, these proposals on various market segments? Sure, sure. So when you look at the article, it, it talks a bit about how this, uh, the proposals can impact the 30-year mortgage rate, um, housing affordability, uh, mortgage servicing and origination platforms, the mortgage insurance sector, and then banks. Now, I'll let my colleagues speak a, a bit to those, but for instance, the 30-year mortgage, a uh, very interesting uh, piece to all this because under both proposals, it seems that the presumption is that you would still have availability of the 30-year fixed mortgage rate, which, as we know, has been a staple in the U.S. for years, right? Uh, comparatively to the rest of the world, uh, where it's just not offered to the same degree as it's offered here. Uh, we think it's promoted a lot of home affordability, um, and at the same time, um, we just wonder how that product would be available and what the rate would be comparatively to what you see now where you have this kind of government guarantee. So that's one piece of it that we speak a bit more to in the article you can take a look at. Uh, the other piece, for instance, um, affordability of housing. Uh, last year, Fannie and Freddie provided like $267 billion in affordable housing loans. Uh, one of the questions is, under the new proposals, 
uh, really what will be the, the effort and the contribution to affordable housing. There doesn't seem to be a lot spelled out at this, at this point in time, so it's just a matter of when and what. But um, as far as banks and uh, mortgage insurance and the uh, origination and servicing platforms, my colleagues will speak more to you on that. Jeremy, thanks for appearing on Credit Matters TV today. Thank you, Sharif. We are now joined by Monica Perlmuter, Senior Director and Analytical Manager in our Servicer Evaluations and Mortgage Originations Group. Monica, it certainly sounds like these proposals are going to impact the way loans are serviced and originated. Can you comment a bit on that? Sure. Thanks for having me. Yes, we expect under any adopted proposal that there will be changes to the way loans are originated and serviced. Depending on the extent of the reforms, there may be changes to an originator's or servicer's systems, their investments in technology, their policies and procedures, their processes, their training programs, and their internal controls. What about, there's often been talk in the market about moving to a common origination or servicing platform, which would obviously create efficiencies in terms of not only the front end system, but then perhaps securitization later on. Do these proposals uh, speak to that at all? They do. In terms of originations, the GSCs currently have separate platforms. Fannie has Desktop Underwriter, or DU, and Freddie has Loan Prospector, or LP. If a common platform were to emerge, originators would likely need to make changes to their current system uh, and replace it with the new one. In addition to the technology costs involved with that, we would expect there to be costs involved with training, with policies and procedures, and with internal controls. And in the meantime, if lenders believe that the platform is likely to change, they may be less likely to make investments in their current systems and technology. Servicers have to follow the GSC servicing guidelines, so depending on the extent of the reforms, system modifications may be needed. It sounds like it could be an expensive endeavor. So if either of these proposals pass, how do you think the servicers are going to, to react? Well, the servicers have been implementing new requirements uh, in preparation for the CFPB's final servicing rules, which go into effect January 10th. Prior to that, some servicers had begun to make changes based on the Servicing Alignment Initiative, the OCC Consent Orders, the National Mortgage Settlement, and the CFPB Draft Rules. So some of our servicers have been making changes for years. In our discussions with servicers, they emphasize certainty and clarity, uh, because making these types of changes typically involves substantial investments in systems and technology, staffing, training, policies and procedures, internal controls. And so we believe that lenders, servicers, and ultimately the borrowers would benefit from quick and thoughtful decisions following the adoption of any reform. Thank you so much for your insights, Monica. Thank you for having me. And thank you for joining us on this segment of Credit Matters TV. Again, as I indicated earlier, we will be recording a second segment that will comment again on the mortgage finance reform uh, efforts going forward and specifically their impact on the insurance and financial institution sectors. Thank you.